this evening. Um, this uh, this evening, and if you want, you can go on ahead and open up to John chapters three and four. And I know that everyone in this room, for the most part, is very spiritually mature. So I don't want to. It's it'll might come off as preaching to the choir a little bit. Um, but over the last week, um, I've started to. I was having a conviction to to share and encourage about evangelism and sharing the gospel and just the different ways that we can think about it and approach it um, because it's an ever-changing world things are you know the new generation is different the new generation is always different but then it's like how do we speak to the new generation and how to understand uh, across generations how to understand across cultures as there's influx uh, so we have people from the west coast who decide to flee the west coast and come back east for some reason or another uh, that would be me that I'm joking about but I'm not the only one I see a lot of blue hair and a lot of tattoos even here in Mechanicsville um, so I'm hoping that <laughs> I'm hoping that this lesson tonight might be able to help us understand um, like softer ways like more subtle ways of understanding how to share the gospel situationally um, but let me open, open us up in a word of prayer. So, uh, Father, thank you for the time that we have together. Thank you for the people in this room, um, for their dedication, for their faithfulness, uh, for their, their, their love for one another. And Lord, I pray that you would work through this church to reach the community and that, um, that the love of Christ would, would reach those who, who are currently in darkness. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So the, when, when we were living back in Vancouver and doing ministry in Portland, um, I had the privilege of doing a pretty consistent week in, week out uh, evangelism team training. Like it was one part training, one part actual practical. And we would go out in the community, we would knock on doors. Um, sometimes we would go to malls and stuff like that, but it was, it was relatively aggressive for like this day and age. Like you know, post COVID where like people are like social distancing, the idea of like you're gonna go up to somebody's door and talk to them, you might get pepper sprayed or something or have the police called on you. I mean, Portland, the police aren't doing much of anything these days, so that wasn't likely. But it was something that we were perpetually thinking about, wondering about what are ways that we can be bringing the truth of the gospel to pre people who in their culture are removed from it? They don't understand it. And what are ways that we can efficiently talk to them? And as I kind of like would look at the Bible, and it's, it's always a good idea to say, what would Jesus do? Did Jesus do it a specific way? Did he do it the same way every time? Or were there times that Jesus might have did things a little bit differently? And we actually see that, that Jesus was kind of attentive to whoever he was talking to. He didn't talk to everyone the exact same way, but if he was talking to one type of person, he might have the conversation one way. And if he talked to a different type of person, he'd probably have the conversation another way. I know many of you uh, have witnessed and evangelized to people over the course of your lives. I, I love hearing Miss Mimi's testimony about her, her pool posse um, and ministry opportunities that she has with them. And the way that she would communicate with her pool posse is probably different than the way she might communicate the gospel to a barista at Starbucks. Um, and what we see in G with Jesus Christ is that like he takes who the person is and the context into account when he begins to communicate with them and and it can help us understand that there are specific things that we absolutely should communicate in the gospel but there's also flexibility to where if we feel the lord saying well maybe we should position something like this or maybe we should reinforce that that it's okay to do that um, but before I go any further, let me, uh, let me go ahead and jump into God's word. Uh, so we will start off, and I'm comparing and contrasting John chapter 3 on a very high level when Jesus talks to Nicodemus with John chapter 4 on a very high level when he talks to the woman at the well. 
So John chapter 3, and I'll read verses 1 through 6. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered him and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So, Nicodemus, and it starts off introducing what kind of a man this is. Nicodemus wasn't a panhandler asking for a coin on the side of the road. I have witness to those also. Nicodemus was a very interesting man. To put it into our modern day context, who this kind of a man was, he would have been a senator of the United States or a Supreme Court justice. He was extremely significant and influential for their, their country. Nicodemus, the name itself, basically means the one who provides victory for the people or the one who leads the people. So that a man with a name like that who is on, in charge of a country, and Jesus even later on acknowledges, like, you are a leader of the people, and these things you do not understand. But that being said, Jesus, uh, Nicodemus was very powerful, very influential, and a lot of people note that Nicodemus appro approached Jesus at night, and this might have just been situational, um, because for their culture, in particular during like the festival season, they would kind of, they would go, they would camp in tents, it was the tabernacling, and it was very common for them at nighttime when it was cool to go and socialize, make their appointments. But nevertheless, a man like Nicodemus, who is powerful enough to garner a conversation with anyone he wants, anytime he is having a conversation with anyone, he is probably watching his watch because he has somebody else to talk to because he is that important. He's the, he kind of reminds me of, it's a man like him that reminds me of stories like George Bush, for instance, when he was president, George Bush Jr. <laughs> when he was president, he had 30 minute meetings. And if you did not communicate everything you needed to communicate in that 30 minute meeting, he would say, thank you very much, Mr. Secretary, can you please show him to the door? And the next meeting would start because time is money and his time is valuable. Jesus does not dilly dally with this man. He makes an interesting statement. He says that we, the Sanhedrin, can see that you are important because you are doing things that only God can do. Now, Jesus could have taken that, that moment and said, well, I am the Son of God. He could have done that, but Jesus didn't do that. Nicodemus was trying to take Jesus and kind of bring him up into the Sanhedrin and say, we take note of you, we have interest in you, and Jesus takes Nicodemus and he brings him down. And he says, Nicodemus, this is something you need to understand about yourself. It's almost like, like um, negotiating. There's another president, a recent president, Donald Trump, who, uh, not a perfect man, but it's interesting that he would talk about negotiating, that it's like boxing. You say one thing, I say another. And Jesus, and it's a form of rhetoric from this point in history, that's kind of typical in patriarchal cultures even today of basically asserting yourself and, and taking control of the conversation. And Jesus, one, did not let himself get, get run over, and two, put Nicodemus in his place. Now, when we are evangelizing to someone on the street, we shouldn't necessarily treat someone like that. Jesus was doing this because this person had an assumption of their status and Jesus was in, for their culture and their form of rhetoric, saying, you're gonna take me seriously and, you're gonna, and I'm going to challenge you with things that you are not aware of. But some things that we need to be aware of from how Jesus approaches him is you need to address your audience as they actually are. So point A is address your audience as they are. And for point A, sub point A, be direct 
with direct people. Nicodemus was very direct in how he approached Jesus. And there may, have, there may be more context. There might have been people around them. But Nicodemus seems very on point and very intentional with how he is talking to Jesus. And Jesus realizes the tone of conversation that Nicodemus is having with him. Nicodemus initiated the conversation, and then Jesus redirected the conversation back at Nicodemus. The, <clears throat> I think it's interesting that a lot of times we are sitting around wondering, oh, if someone will only share me, share, you know, ask me what the gospel is. You know, a lot of times we don't hear people just walk up and say, please, will you share the gospel with me? Sometimes it happens, but most of the time we have to initiate the conversation, and we will see that with the woman at the well. But here Nicodemus initiated the conversation, and Jesus very directly and kind of aggressively pursues the conversation. The, and the, the concept that I would hope that we take from this and understand is not that we necessarily need to be rude or aggressive, but we need to be earnest. We need to, if we are talking to someone that we can sense time is important to them, that they're being intentional with us to be direct. Um, and there's a concept called an elevator pitch. In an elevator pitch, people in the business world talk about this a lot, where if you are going to, oh, the 13th floor of Sears Tower, or the Chrysler Building, and someone who looks very impressive asks you, oh, so what are you coming up for? Within the duration of the elevator ride, you say what your business is, because you want them to respect you, and you want to communicate effectively what your intention is. And you might be wondering, how does this manifest in, in our, our world today. So for a while, I would wonder at work, how is it that I can effectively share the gospel with my coworkers while I'm on the clock? It's one thing to be able to share the gospel with a coworker over lunch, which is great to do. If you have a work context or if you have a social context where you can easily invite someone to lunch, that is a great time to share the gospel, and you can do it in a lot more calm way. Um, but I, over the time, started to understand that I need to do a couple of things. One, think about my personal testimony, and how can I share my personal testimony, if need be, almost like it were an entire sermon, and if need be, in less than two minutes. So when I was working in, in Vancouver, I had a coworker who I learned was Mormon. He was actually a younger man than me, or rather he had previously been Mormon. And we were in the back of a trailer. It's probably 90 plus degrees in this trailer, and we're lugging toilets. It's not easy work. And he starts sharing about his life growing up, that he was Mormon, that his parents had had a divorce, and that Mormonism played a part in it. So I start to realize he's sharing things in his life that I can kind of relate to. Not that I was Mormon, my parents didn't go through a divorce, but I had a religious upbringing, and there are times that it was good, and there are times that it wasn't quite as good. And I was able to take the time while we were in the middle of working and doing physical labor to share my testimony in the conversation, and in through that, help him understand that I was a Christian, and that I was available for spiritual conversations if he wanted to pursue them in the future, but it was something that I actually kind of disciplined myself in before that so that when those kind of moments arose, I would be able to communicate my relationship with God through my testimony and God through that. So under, con under concept uh, point A, and I wish I kind of bullet pointed it out a little differently, but practice sharing the gospel of the gospel or your testimony in under two minutes. And this may sound like an odd practice to do, um, but if you can think about how you would share the gospel over the context of, say, lunch or having coffee with a friend, and then if you can whittle it down to its most crucial points and communicate that in less than two minutes, you can communicate the gospel in a range of circumstances. And and sometimes you might be at a checkout line or something like that. 
you have a quick conversation with the lady checking you out or a quick conversation with the person right behind you and being able to communicate decisively and effectively in a brief amount of time can be very helpful. And another point that I'd like to make from Nicodemus, which I think is so interesting, because there are things that hold people back from sharing the gospel. Sometimes it's, what if I forget to say something crucial and important? And I, I've included um, the Romans Road for you to review if that helps. Um, a lot of times, if you focus on who Jesus Christ is, that he's the son of God, that he came to die for our sins and he rose again, that is the crux of what a lost person needs to hear. But sometimes we worry, what if I forget something? And another big worry is, what if I get rejected? What if this person doesn't accept the gospel? What does that say of me? I think it's interesting that Jesus, the Son of God, who is perfect, the way he communicated with Nicodemus, Nicodemus walked away, at least at this point in his life, not knowing really who Jesus was. Jesus Christ did not fail. Nicodemus was just not ready to receive the truth. So we are going to encounter people that, that we talk with them. We may share the gospel perfectly with them. We may share with them something that we've shared a hundred times, and they don't receive it. Don't be afraid. Don't, don't feel like you did anything wrong. It's just that this person has not yet accepted Jesus Christ. It is most important for us to be obedient to God. They need to be obedient to God also. So I want to encourage you in that. If, you, if there's been a time where you've shared the gospel and it didn't go as cleanly as you thought it would, don't worry about that. It's important to be obedient to God. That's what's most important. So then, in point two, or the second point, in John chapter four, we see the woman at the well. And it's night and day on multiple levels. And I can't help but think that the Holy Spirit might have directed John to write these, these conversations back to back as a compare and contrast. You have Nicodemus who is, well, I'll read a little bit from John chapter 4, and many of us know who the woman of the well is, um, but it will start to speak for itself. So John chapter 4 verse 6, now Jacob's well was there. Jesus therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me, give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and saith unto her, If thou knowest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me a drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. So thinking of who she is in, con in contrast to Nicodemus, uh, Nicodemus is a man, she is a woman. Nicodemus was high in culture and was Jewish. She was a Samaritan. Uh, Nicodemus was highly respected. We don't even see what her name is in, in the book here. Um, and there were, there were theological differences that the Samaritans had from the Jews. Um, it's basically night and day. And it was even a little peculiar that Jesus would be striking a conversation with her to begin with, as she notes. Um, but there are going to be times where we might have the Holy Spirit tugging on us. Maybe we should talk to this person. Maybe we should strike a conversation with this person, and we should be attentive to the Holy Spirit when that happens. Um, and, and the thing that I find interesting about her is that it seems in our country more and more we're becoming aware of cultural differences. What's this person's background? What are they, what are they like politically? Where do they grow up? There were times when we were on the West Coast that I would see someone that I would think, oh, I can relate to. They are relatively wealthy, they look well-educated, and I start up a conversation with them and whoop, just clear past them. It was, it was, it was odd. Um, and I think it's interesting that from a, 
from a cultural standpoint, Nicodemus probably on some level assumed Jesus might have been below him. The woman at the well understood that Jesus, on some extent culturally, was above her. It is, a lot of times, it is easier for us when we're sharing the, cult, uh, sharing the gospel, to share the gospel with people who will respect us. It's hard to share the gospel up, a lot of times, unfortunately. The Holy Spirit can definitely break down walls and make opportunities happen, but a lot of our observations over when we were in Portland, and I think it's pretty true of society, is that a lot of times when people are lower, like, you know, less off financially, they're more willing to listen to the gospel. People that are very wealthy, they don't need God to take care of them week in, week out. A lot of times they are very conceited and prideful. Um, now, just because people are poor does not mean they are virtuous, and just because people are wealthy does not mean that they are necessarily godless, but it's harder to break through to them. But Jesus took this opportunity to reach to the woman at the well, and he initiated the conversation. And I would encourage everyone that when you're initiating the conversation to initiate it thoughtfully um, and welcome your audience into a conversation. And by what I, what I mean by thoughtfully is try to meet them kind of like with Nicodemus, meet them where they're at, but but to welcome them into a conversation. Like this woman was probably a little intimidated and Jesus didn't just simply say, give me a drink of water. He said, well, if you knew who I was, you would understand that I have things that I want to offer you too, that this is something that I am here to meet with you in. And it's good for us generally to also want to get to know who it is we're talking to if possible. Um, you know, there's the expression that people may not know how much we care unless they care that we know. I might have said that wrong. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. But a lot of times people, if you just talk at someone, they won't necessarily care what you're, ha what you're saying to them. But if they know that you are invested in them as a person or at least relatively aware in who they are as a person, they might actually listen to you. Uh, so the next blank is the more you listen to them, the more uh, likely they will listen to you. Um, when we would go out and evangelize in Portland, we, and we would go door to door, and a lot of times, like, like our end goal was ultimately to share the gospel with them. But our, the way that we would instigate it a lot of times, would we, would, we would say, well, we're from the church down the road, we're trying to get to know our neighbors, and you know, what they're like. We just, we want to know, what's your name, and is there a religion that you follow? Well, how is it, you know, how did you join that religion? And as they start unpackaging who they are and why they believe what they believe, you start to apply apologetics to it, and you start to realize, well, they don't have, they haven't had their sins forgiven. They, they are still separated from God. And you can ask them those questions, well, well what do you think about evil in the world? What do you think about, you know, is there any, any time that someone's hurt you, or is there any time that you've hurt someone? How do you think God feels about that? And having those conversations with them and them starting to open up. Um, and as you're also getting to know them, treat questions that they may have respectfully, um, but remembering to focus on the gospel. Uh, and that brings me to verse twenty. Let's see, uh, 22 through 26. So the woman asked him a question about how we should worship. In verse 21 it says, um, or Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet in Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye worship ye know not. Ye, uh, we know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. For the hour cometh and is, and is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such worship, uh, uh, such to worship him. God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. 
So she asked him a question because she sensed that he was a prophet. You know, Jesus asked her, bring your husband. And she said, I, d I don't have a husband. He's like, that's, that's right. You've, you've had a couple of husbands already, and the man you're with right now isn't your husband. I think it's interesting that both with Jesus and, or both with Jesus, both with Nicodemus and with the woman at the well, at a certain point, he started to poke at their sin. And that's something crucial, and that's something hard in sharing the gospel, is at a certain point, you have to bring up the sin issue. Um, there's a, a, an evangelist, uh, Ray Comfort. Um, he's very interesting to watch sometimes. And in his, his testimony, I've, I've listened to his testimony, how he started evangelizing. He was, at, he was in mega churches in Australia during the 80s, and he sensed spiritual deadness in them. And he became convicted one day. He was just traveling cross country and had an hour long conversation with a guy who was formerly a Christian, had rejected Christianity. And he realized that this guy had never been challenged on sin. And he started to realize that the churches that he was affiliated with never talked about sin. And sin was the one thing that truly separates us from God. You know, Jesus, you know, poked at these things. Nicodemus, you are spiritually separated from God. Woman of the well, you have a checkered past. But he still invited her to, to, to engage with him. The, um, and a lot of times it may be odd to poke someone's sin. Sometimes people will be offended by that. And if you feel that sin needs to be addressed, but you're not sure if you're at a comfortable level with the person you're evangelizing to do that, you can share your testimony. That's something that I've done and I've seen people I've, I've worked with do is, like there would be times we would knock on a door and it's a lesbian couple, but we want to share the gospel with them. So we have a 30 minute conversation talking about their pets, talking about where they went to school, how long have they been living in the area, what are their spiritual beliefs, and then we say, well, this is what we believe, that you know, Jesus Christ is our savior, that I'm a sinner before God, that if Jesus Christ didn't die for my sins and actually list off literal sins that have been committed, that if Jesus didn't die for me, that I would be separated from God and I would eventually go to hell for that. And they would listen to that and they would take it in. And sometimes for some people in our culture, and it's something more of a tendency for millennials and younger people is to be extremely defensive and to be extremely afraid of rejection. Um, so thinking of different ways to talk about sin and start to broach the topic situationally can be helpful. Um, but the ultimately, whether it's someone like Nicodemus or it's someone like the woman at the well, what we should be trying to do is invite people to a relationship. Um, we should be helping them get to know us a little bit but as they get to know us, they will get to know Jesus Christ. Um, so as you and your audience get to know one another, you help them begin a relationship with Jesus Christ. And if, you are sh if you're sharing your life with them, you will be also sharing the truth of the gospel with them. Just make sure that you're prioritizing the gospel through it all. And... And it's okay if, it's, if they don't come to faith. Um, there are many people these days that need to hear the truth of the gospel, but need to also know that the Christian talking to them is not an angry person, that this person was loving to them, and maybe the next person may be able to plant more seed and get farther with them. So thank you for your time. I hope that encourages you. You know, I hope that um, as conversations come up that it won't be... It won't be fearful for you, but it'll be an opportunity where you can just let the Holy Spirit work and let the gospel stand up for itself. Well, let, I guess we'll go ahead and break up into groups. Um, you know, we'll take about uh, maybe five to ten minutes uh, and pray.